All right, good evening, everyone. We're so excited to have you here for the Envirothon Aquatics Training. This is the second in aquatics training. Um, our speaker tonight is Chelsea Miller with the Department of Natural Resources. Um, Chelsea, thanks for all you do for Envirothon um, and for creating this test and working with us and providing this training for our students this evening. So I'm gonna remind everyone to put questions in the chat and turn it over to you now. Hi everybody, thank you for coming tonight um, for the second session for aquatics training. Uh, as April said, I'm Chelsea Miller. I am the aquatic, an aquatic resource educator with Maryland Department of Natural Resources. I am specifically in the Chesapeake and Coastal Services Unit. Um, and I have created the test for you guys this year that will be virtual. Um, so let's see. Um, one thing I want to warn, um, last time my dog was a little bit noisy, um, but this time I hope that won't be the case. If you miss anything, just say it in the chat and I can go back over it. Um, and April, you can go ahead and share the PowerPoint if you don't mind. Yep, I'm sorry, give me, give me one second. Switch. Okay. Sorry guys, Friday evening. I'm sure you <laughs> feels. Well, and while she's doing that, I can, um, we saw that there were some pre-registered questions. Um, I will touch on those at the end of the PowerPoint and then there will be plenty of time for more questions. Um, and you guys can feel free as I'm talking if you wanna throw a question in the, in the chat. Um, I have it up so I, I'll be able to see um, better this time. Sorry, here it comes. My computer signed me out of all my programs right before training started. <laughs> that happens to me a lot. There we go. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, so to start, uh, I know an important question you guys probably have is the format of the test. Um, so there's four sections in the aquatic test. There's the abiotic section, biotic, aquatic environments, and then water protection and conservation. Um, the fifth topic, it's not separate. It's woven into all of them and it is water related. So I really wouldn't worry too much about that one, so long as you study the materials that I cover in this PowerPoint and in this training session, then you guys will be good to go. Um, most of the questions are gonna be um, fill in the blank, multiple choice, some matching. Um, there's no true or false, and there are some short answers. Um, I think there's a drawing question, and then you will have to do identification. That was, uh, I think, one of the pre-registered questions. Uh, you will be doing fish identification, there will be two. Um, and then also macro invertebrate identification. Um, and just because I just saw the questions now, I'm just gonna touch on them. Um, they, the common names is as far, you guys don't need to know the scientific names. As long as you can put the common name, um, then, then that's fine. Let's see. Um, oh, and the sections are not in order um, and the questions aren't in any particular order. So um, you can start one section and get, like, let's say you start with um, biotic. You can do biotic and then you can go and do water protection and conservation um, and then go and do the first one. But once you enter a section, you do have to complete that section um, and then each one has an allotted amount of time. I think in total, how, how much time, April, do they have total for the test? A total of two hours to complete the entire test. Okay, yeah, so you guys have a total of two hours um, and ours are in uh, like 
there's one section that's 20 minutes, a few sections that are 40 minutes, and that's just because of the nature of the different questions. In some of them, you might have to click a link or use a dichotomous key. Um, and if that's in that section, that will have more time allotted for you. Um, sorry, guys. Lay down. Um, I see a question. Does the rule still apply this year that if we use the scientific name, we can get extra points? Um, I am actually new this. So, and last year the Envirothon was canceled. So I did not know that this was an option. Um, I'm going to say no, just because I didn't know that that was the case. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Okay. Another question we've had to come up that I want to touch on while you're while you're on this part about format is, um, is it a lot more content since we're giving you two hours? And the answer to that is no. It, it's the same test as if you were going to do it in person. We're just allotting more time because of the nature of it being a virtual test. So that's something I know some people have worried about. So. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, this test is, it's pretty much the same. I, um, it's really just the downside that you won't have like actual hands-on activities. Um, so it'll be more concepts and um, understanding the, the materials. Um, and so unfortunately you won't be able to do like a, like physically test the water or, or have a physical fish in front of you. It will be a picture. Um, but it but it'll be the same content yeah and we can move to the next slide where i'll go i'm going to go over each of those sections and this is i guess you could consider it a study guide um this will be like the main points that uh you should really focus on for abiotic you have the water cycle and for the water cycle you want to know um <clears throat> how water is globally and then how that's getting to you locally um it plays an important role in soil nutrient erosion and then knowing how um, the climatic, it has a climatic influences. Um, a huge one for this section is watersheds in general. So knowing healthy versus unhealthy watersheds, knowing what they do for the environment, what they do for humans, um, knowing the boundaries and the like, uh, the landscape of a watershed, the topography, and stream orders. Um, and then lastly, understanding why aquatic organisms and water quality is affected by physical, chemical, and biological conditions. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a good graphic to study. It should be up on my resource page as well. And um, it says, what about freshwater? So knowing that there's actually very little freshwater, so about 3% of all water on earth is fresh. Um, so not, not a whole lot. Um, you wanna know the, what's the main drivers of water. You've got um, currents, wind, gravity, and solar heat. And then you wanna know what happens after a precipitation event. Um, such as surface runoff and infiltration. And you can see all of that right here in this graph. So if you could, if you could see this graph without it labeled and be able to label it, that would be a good practice and uh, way to study. Um, yeah, so that if you can label this without seeing the words, um, that would be a great way to practice. And on to watersheds. Um, so know the definition of a watershed. It's a land area that drains to one stream, lake, or river. It affects the water quality in the water body that it surrounds. And for the, the next bullet, um, why are these, why are healthy watersheds important? And knowing the difference between an unhealthy one and a an healthy one. Um, you've got economic benefits and ecosystem services. For these, you should know a handful of examples of each and then be able to explain it. Um, so I'll give you some examples now. We have ecosystem services would be improved water quality, 
Um, so your natural landscapes and floodplains are gonna filter pollutants um, and promote nutrient cycling and retain sediment. So the roots from the plants are gonna retain that, the stream banks and keep them intact. And then um, you have carbon storage opportunities. So watersheds also store carbon like forests um, and they're capable of sequestering carbon, offsetting um, greenhouse gases, which is important for climate change impacts. Um, you've got increased resilience in the face of climate change. So watersheds help and wetlands help um, prevent flooding events. And then reduced risk for invasive species colonization. And that's like naturally functioning ecosystems are going to be more resilient uh, with their indigenous species there than it would be if they were um, non-indigenous. Some economic benefits, I'm gonna go over the second, uh, oh, I did it backwards, I'm sorry guys. Now I'm doing the economic benefits. So this would be reduced drinking water treatment and infrastructure costs, uh, reduced flood mitigation costs. So when it floods, like they have to do things to fix that and that causes issues for us um, and houses, et cetera. Um, so less floods, that's a reduced cost. Apologies. Um, job opportunities, increased revenues and job opportunities, and then increased property values as well. So people love being on waterfront property. <clears throat> And we can go to the next slide. Um, so here's stream orders. You want to know how, like if you saw a blank image of this, you want to be able to fill in the stream orders. And so to do that, like ordered streams combined and move up only one level. For instance, one plus one is going to equal two. So that top first order, one and one and then two. And then um, unlike ordered streams combine and remain at a higher order level. So if it's a two plus a one, it's going to stay at two. Um, this is something you can practice. You can pull out a map, look at an image of a stream and see if you can label the stream orders. This is something that's important when you're doing systematic mapping. Um, it's used in modeling and analysis of the mor morphological characteristics of streams. Um, and th that's why it's important to know those and be able to label them. And the next slide we have stream runoff and what effect or yeah, and what affects it. Uh, so you have the shape of the watershed, the slope, land use, vegetation and development, um, land geology and soils. Uh, the shape of the water fed, Watershed will affect the rate. The slope will affect the rate. Land use can affect the rate and the amount. And then the geology and soils are gonna affect the amount. Um, so the shape is um, going to change the distance of the rain event to the discharge. So it can slow or increase the rate of flow. Um, and then slope, that's kind of easy. The steeper the slope, the faster it's gonna flow. Um, and then forested areas have little runoff in small, medium rain events compared to no forested. And vegetation traps and causes a barrier to flow. It can slow it down. Um, and then for land geology and soils, clay soils have a lower permeability than sandy soils. And these are just, uh, what I was just telling you is being able to describe what it's affecting and how it's affecting it. If you can do that, then you'll be good to go. Uh, and on the same note with stream flow and stream flow changes, you want to know um, examples of natural mechanisms and be able to explain them and human induced mechanisms and be able to explain them. So natural examples would be runoff from rainfall, runoff from snowmelt, um, evaporation from soil and surface water, <clears throat> transpiration by vegetation, groundwater discharge, and sedimentation of lakes and wetlands, um, formation of glaciers and permafrost. And then some human-induced would be um, 
river flow regulation for hydropower would be an example, uh, or navigation, like for boats or cargo ships. Um, construction and removal, when they do big construction sites, they'll have to like build a retention pond to help trap some of the excess sediment that's gonna very easily run off. Um, they do stream channelization and levee construction. These would be more human induced ones. Some wetlands, like they drain some wetlands, drainage of wetlands would be human induced. Um, and urbanization will also um, affect the stream flow. The images I have on this slide um, are showing you examples of riparian zones and floodplains. And this was just so, um, giving you another way to look at it. It's a visual as opposed to wording. Um, so the riparian zone are the trees along the side acting as like a buffer to trap pollutants and such as from farms, like it's going to help prevent um, excess um, nitrates and phosphorus <clears throat> from getting into the water. And then you have your entire floodplain and that's got the whole valley width. Okay. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with pH and the pH scale. So knowing what's neutral, seven's neutral, um, as you go up in scale towards 14, that's basic. Going down, that's acidic. What you guys need to know is what pH is a livable pH for living organisms in the water. So what pH does the water need to be for organisms to survive? There's, it's usually a range um, and it's usually, I think around eight. Um, and then knowing how climate change is impacting the pH of the water, uh, making it more acidic. So ocean acidification is a big issue uh, along with the temperature changes. Uh, so having a good understanding of the scale and what pH is required for living, organ living aquatic organisms. And on top of pH, some more um, chemicals and biological features, temperature, salinity, and oxygen, and the relationship. Knowing that cold water is gonna hold more oxygen than warm water, and fresh water is gonna hold more oxygen than saline water, so cold, fresh, super high in oxygen, warm saline is going to be really low. It's also the, the deeper you go, you're going to have less oxygen as well because you're um, getting farther from the surface. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, sorry. And then knowing that that's, uh, temperature trumps salinity. Sorry, I keep stumbling over my words. Um, yeah, <clears throat> temperature sumps, trumps salinity, so warmer water cannot dissolve oxygen as easily as colder water. Um, and then, yeah, you can move forward. This is an image of the global conveyor belt, and I like this one because it um, helps to show you the global circulation of how the temperature and the salty of the water. So cold, salty, dense water sinks toward the bottom. <clears throat> and then warmer, fresher, less dense water is rising to the surface. And then this is showing you like globally where you're going to see those moving around. So study that and that will help you as well. Um, so for all of those, go through those slides. If you understand those for abiotic, that's a good focal point, but definitely go through the resources um, and make sure you understand all those concepts. And then the other, another section is biotic. This is gonna focus on food webs, uh, how energy and matter flow within an ecosystem. You need to be able to identify common, rare, threatened, and endangered aquatic species, as well as aquatic nuisance species. And April's just, I think she was pulling up the resources. Um, 
Sorry, you want to know? I didn't realize you could see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I saw what you were doing. Um, so know how to use the dichotomous keys for identifying animals. There are on the reference list, the resources list, where there's an asterisk is where you're going to have that available to you at the test. So you'll have the dichotomous keys when you're doing this. So for a good a way to save time is if you familiarize yourself with the key and practice a few times with different species so that when you do see that image of the fish, you can fairly easily step-by-step -step go through the dichotomous key and get to the answer. For the fish species, it's just the one from DNR that I have available to you. For the macroinvertebrates, you have two, and I can touch on that a little bit later. Um, and the reason I did two was because one of them has really um, in microscope, like microscope imagery on it and um, some better graphics. And whether you're more of a visual person or you like reading the, the description, you have two different um, dichotomous keys to go off of, like whichever one you prefer to use. Um, and then being familiar with aquatic plants and animals visually and descriptively. So if you see, like if the, if I describe a plant to you, you should be able to, for the, for the very common ones, you should be able to identify them. And we go to the next slide. All right. And then this slide, don't worry too, too much about this. Just know, understand the difference between a habitat and an ecosystem and the energy flow and nutrient flow within these. So a habitat is an area where a plant or animal naturally lives or grows. And I, I like to think of a habitat as like your house, uh, your home that you live in, and then your community, the community you live in is your, is your um, ecosystem. So like your neighborhood would be your ecosystem and your house would be your habitat. And um, there's energy flowing through and com different communities and populations interacting with each other <clears throat> for a wholesome interconnected environment. So that, that's what I would focus on for that. And this slide is showing a Chesapeake Bay food web. You're not, to, you don't have to know like specifically Chesapeake Bay, but understanding how, what food webs are, what they're showing. I like this one because it has the trophic levels on the side. You got top predators uh, that don't really have a, a predator. They're the apex sometimes. Um, and then higher level consumers lower level consumers and your producers. So you need to know if the arrow is pointing at the osprey, that means the osprey is eating that larger fish. The bald eagle is eating the larger fish and then the larger fish is eating the smaller fish, so on and so forth. The arrows are symbolizing the energy flow and taking one thing out, you can see it would um, disrupt the flow of energy and cause kind of a cascade effect of impacts, um, causing in, you know spikes in some populations or extreme drops in some populations, um, throwing off the balance that is within this ecosystem. And you want to practice this, uh, be able to do one of your own, maybe um, using different species, just uh, practice, practice on that one. And here I put biotic slash aquatic because this topic comes up in both, they're overlapping. So this is knowing the difference between non-native, um, plant non-native species and non-native invasive species. So if it's invasive, it means it's highly intrusive to the environment, to the ecosystem. Um, something that's coming in and displacing other organisms or extremely outcompeting them um, or bringing in diseases um, that, that they're not prepared for. So an, Emerald ash boring beetles are invasive and 
blue catfish are invasive. And I'll, I'll go over some more examples as we go. And then knowing different ways that they can become introduced uh, for aquatics, that's highly piggybacking on boats uh, and your boots and your equipment. Um, so that's why we encourage you to clean everything off. And there's a lot of laws and regulations about that and transferring things from one body of water to another. Um, these, are, these are huge ways that they can be introduced. And then also as pets being released, uh, there was goldfish released in the Patuxent River. So there's like these huge gold, orange goldfish that are in Maryland's Patuxent River um, because they were released in there. Um, red-eared sliders are a turtle in the water that are spread because of pets. Um, and also knowing their impacts, like I said, they displace other species, they outcompete them. Um, they cause negative impacts in some way. There's some um, control methods that you can use to prevent this or, or remove them. So that can be physically, actually physically removing it, um, chemically using different chemicals uh, safely, obviously. And what else might? Yeah, and educating also what we're doing today and then what you guys are learning spreading the awareness of invasive species, how to stop them and how to prevent the spread is huge. Um, so know, know some of those, know some of each of these examples and explaining the difference between non-native and invasive, non-native invasive introduction methods, effects and control methods. And here, since I, you know, obviously can't tell you which fish picture will be up there. These are some common ones that I recommend you study and look at, be able to identify them. Maybe you guys could take one of these and use the dichotomous key, see if you can figure it out. Up in the top left, I've got a bluegill sunfish. In the middle, there's a white perch. And then at the bottom is that invasive blue catfish. So these are a, just a list of some common ones for you to have something to study off of and practice with. Um, and definitely know those invasive ones, the blue catfish and the northern snakehead. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, and apologies. The importance of knowing how to identify a fish is a large part of when you're going fishing, you have size limits and um, like different regulations for each species. So like rockfish has a different catch limit than a bluegill sunfish and different size limits than the other one. So being able to identify them is crucial if you're, especially if you're an angler. Here's some common aquatic invasive species. So this is a list of common ones. If you know these, you won't have any problems. Um, Northern snakehead is that one in the top left. And um, the zebra mussel is the top right. And Phragmites is there at the bottom. Um, Phragmites is all over the place in Maryland. Um, that's a good one to study and know. The northern snakehead, that's a catch and kill species. So if it's by law, if you catch that one, you cannot return it to the water and you can't transport it live because they actually can survive for a really long time out of water um, and they can, they can like crawl across land so they can even hop bodies of water. So you have to, when you catch it, kill that one on catch. <clears throat> Here is some examples of submerged aquatic vegetation. These are really important for the aquatic organisms. Subaquatic vegetation, um, or what we call SABs, are providing nurseries for small fish. Um, they are providing oxygen in the water. They are filtering the water. They're keeping it healthy and clean and providing habitat. Very, very important. The one. The, uh, I have imaged at the top, hydrilla. This one is actually invasive and um, it can actually grow in these big, huge mats and it kind of suffocates the water. It 
uh, blocks the sunlight from getting through to the bottom. Um, and it can get caught in boat props. Um, so this one can actually be a nuisance species. Uh, it can be troublesome. But then the one at the bottom left, um, widgeon grass, that's a, that's a native one. That's a common species to study. Um, and wild celery too. This, I just have the widgeon grass imaged here. Um, and these are, again, incredibly important and really good for the aquatic organisms in the water providing habitat. And the next slide I have here is Atlantic Midhaven. And this is important to study because it is one of, it supports one of the largest commercial fisheries in on the Atlantic coast. Um, lots of things eat this, osprey eat tons of menhaden. They're a forage species, a key link in the food web, um, and they can be indicators. Their population levels can help people assess the health of the bay. Um, and knowing different commercial fishes is important too, knowing they're big economy drivers and um, it's a huge part of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay system is fisheries and forage species. Um, and this is a like a key, key species for our area. Here's our macroinvertebrates. And like I said, you will have to identify some of these common names. You do not need to know the scientific names um, and focus on those sensitive orders because these are the ones that are showing us if, they're, if you find the sensitive orders in your stream, it's an indicator that you have a very healthy stream. You also want a diversity of macroinvertebrates in your stream. Um, if you fought and Find, if you find the um, more tolerant ones and none of the sensitive ones, that's going to help you determine if your stream is unhealthy. Uh, and there's two different keys, the Stroud Center's key and the DNR key that you have both of them available to you. Uh, so just choose which one is your favorite, practice with that one, and you'll have it at the test. Um, and it will be just a picture. It'll be a picture and then you link to the key. I think it pops up in another window and uh, it's still within the system. It's just in another window. So you can kind of click back and forth, but that's why we gave you guys more time on these sections because of the clicking back and forth and going through the key. So you will have plenty of time. I wouldn't stress about that. Um, just uh, stay focused and go through the key and you, you'll get to the right answer. Um, you're going to look at the number and length of tails, the location of their gills, the wing buds, the thickness and shape of the body. Um, and then at the bottom, I just have a list of some common ones. Stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, water pennies. Um, these are some sensitive ones. Um, and gilled snails. The moderately sensitive ones would be your net spinning caddisflies, alderflies, craneflies, damselflies, and dragonflies. Um, and scuds and crayfish too. And then tolerant ones would be black flies and um, midges, leeches, and worms. Um, so knowing, knowing the common ones and being able to use a dichotomous key to identify them. You can identify it on spot, that's amazing. <laughs> and here I just have pictured a few examples with the aligning image. So mayfly on the left, that's ephemeroptera, stonefly, plecoptera, and um, let's go away. and then caddisfly, trichoptera, the sensitive ones. Oh, someone just noted fun fact, hydrilla and its variants are sold at pet stores. Wow. That is about that. And here is a image you can study of the anatomy key, um, the different parts. So as you're prepping and trying to use the dichotomous key, if you need this as you're going along, you can practice with this, showing you where everything is, the thorax, the head, abdomen, where the gills will be, um, and the eyes and antennas, your legs, and the tails.
And now we've, we're on to the aquatic environment section. So we are here, we need to be able to identify aquatic and wetland environments based on their physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. No characteristics of different types of aquifers and understand historical trends and threats to groundwater quantity and quality. So what, what is going to be polluting our groundwater and impacting our groundwater? And then um, I'll cover in another slide some an example of an aquifer that you should study. Definitely know Maryland's physiological provinces and be able to describe Here's some more overlap, native, non-native and invasive species. And the pictures at the bottom down below, um, you've got like a beachy coastline where it looks like they did some grass planting. And then in the middle, you have a basic stream going through Maryland. And bottom right is a aerial shot of a marsh. This is Jug Bay on the Patuxent River. Um, and that light colored grass in there is a bunch of wild rice and the darker colored grass is the invasive Phragmites. Here we are showing you to the left, anadromous fish and to the right, catadromous. And in the examples here, your anadromous fish are fish that are migrating from sea, sorry, are migrating upriver from the sea to spawn. Salmon do this, yellow perch do this, um, and the map here is a quality of habitat. Sorry it's so small, but it, you don't need to study it. It, it was just for, your, uh, um, for your, you to look at because they're going up from the bay and into these rivers to spawn. And then eels, this is an American eel on the right, they're catadromous. They do the opposite. They go from the river to the sea to spawn. An American eel is the only species we have that is catadromous. Here's the example of the aquifer I want you to study. This is a coastal aquifer, and it, this is showing saltwater intrusion. So the image on the on the left side here, the graphic is showing you where um, what the natural condition is supposed to look like. And then the bottom is where you're having saltwater intrusion because of over pumping of that fresh water. They're pumping from that well. And it's drawing that water table down, allowing for the salt water to intrude. Um, so I'm gonna go over how groundwater is one of our most valuable resources. And it's something you probably never really see or really think about. And it's from, um, Sorry, as you may have read, most of the void spaces in the rocks below the water table are filled with water and then the rocks have different porosity and permeability characteristics, which means that the water does not move around the same way in all the rocks below it. And then re over pumping it too much, not um, too quickly for the recharge rate. So like it's recharging through precipitation and seepage. And if you're pumping it too quickly um, for the recharge rate, this, this could happen. The saltwater intrusion could happen. Um, and there are, resource that there are two resources on the list where there's like a paragraph under a graphic similar to this one. You don't need to know in extreme detail, but understand how it happens. Um, and the impacts, yeah, and you should be good on that. So I already said, definitely know the, physio the physiographic provinces of Maryland, the Appalachian Plateau, Ridge and Valley, Blue Ridge, Piedmont, and Coastal Plain. There's a graphic right here on the slide for you to study with. Um, so the Appalachian province, that covers 6% of the state. And it's the only one that drains to both the Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Your Ridge and Valley province occupies about 12% of the state. The Blue Ridge covers about 5% of the state. The Piedmont covers about 29% of the state. 
And the coastal plain is the largest one, covering about 48% of the state. That's the biggest one is the coastal. Uh, and then the Appalachian one is the one that can that's draining to the Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And this is our last section here, water protection and conservation. So here you need to be able to interpret major um, federal laws and methods used to protect water quality, surface and groundwater and be familiar with the federal, state, and county agencies that provide oversight of these laws and these regulations. Um, and then understand the impacts of climate change and some of the mitigation strategies. Those are the main three things to look at for this section. So we, we need to know that the Maryland Department of the Environment is who oversees the local water management plans and here's just a list of some issues they're gonna face with climate change. We have higher temperatures in the waters, which is impacting the um, native species in the water, increased flooding, as we talked about, shifting precipitation patterns, increased runoff, more dry periods and droughts, and then you have rising sea levels, and we even have eroding shorelines. Um, more frequent and more intense storms, and then changes in the water demand and water quality. So definitely have a handful of these in your head, understanding their impacts. Here's a little more specific of a slide of agri agrochemical handling facilities, um, understanding what those are, reading about them, and um, what good they do for the farmers and for the ecosystem. They provide a stable, safe surface for equipment storage. They reduce the risk of spills or leaks during um, loading, unloading, and mixing. And they protect the environment by confining these spills, which is making it faster and effective, more effective, and keeping the area clean. It's also reducing the risk of spills into waterways by keeping it contained and reducing the risk to humans um, keeping it contained. So this is like a facility that they would have um, maybe an enclosed area with um, paved bottom so it's not seeping into anything. Um, and since it's enclosed, it's not gonna run off. The roof is gonna keep the rain from coming in and all of the chemicals that the farmer is using will be in this facility. And when they're mixing the chemicals, they're gonna be doing it in this facility. And this is to help prevent anything from getting into the soil, anything from um, getting into any local waterways. And this is an important one to study. But there are other examples and that's on the next slide. Here's some other ones. These are huge to reduce erosion, such as cover crops, critical area planting, pasture planting, um, riparian buffers, like I said, uh, with the river sides and the stream sides, those riparian buffers lined with forests or trees and plants are going to help absorb excess nutrients from getting into the water. And then grassed waterways, again, vegetation along the water, diversion and livestock fencing, uh, just to keep them from doing their business right in the water, you know, just have a fence up and keep them away. And then here's some of the um, water protection conservation laws to study, TMDLs. So the total maximum daily loads, this was established um, by the EPA in 2010. And there are six states in this dis and the district New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. And the um, nutrients that they're measuring are nitrates, phosphorus, and the sediment. Um, you'll have some questions on water usage. So an average Maryland citizen uses 100 gallons of water per day. The U.S. uses 355,000 um, million gallons per day. That's a, a 
taken from 2010, by the way. Four states use one fourth of all U.S. withdrawals, and those four states are California, Texas, Idaho, and Florida. And the two highest categories for water use um, are thermoelectric power and irrigation. But below I have, there's eight different categories there of water use, public supply, self-supported domestic wells, irrigation, livestock, aquaculture, um, manufacturing, mining, and thermoelectric power. And the thermoelectric power and irrigation are two of the largest. Here's some different ways in the home and outside that you can do to help um, at home. Inside, you will only run the dishwasher when full. One that was new for me, plug the drain while hand washing. And sh everyone knows about shorter showers. Um, don't, don't leave the water running when you're brushing your teeth. Um, checking regularly for leaks is a big deal. Replacing equipment, shower heads, pipes, that kind of stuff. Um, that's like a, a major cause of um, waste, water waste. And then outside, a lot of schools do rain barrels and pollinator gardens and rain gardens, but you can do this at home too. And water your plants at the coolest time of the day to prevent evaporation. And then increase the mowing height to two to three inches. This can prevent weeds from coming in. Um, yeah, so I would say have a few of these. Pick ones that are your favorite and stick to those and you'll be good for those kinds of questions. Oh, is that my last slide? I think so. Yeah, that was my last slide. Okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. If you guys want to ask any questions, anything about, even if it's just format of the test or tips or things, and you can ask it in the chat. I'll read it aloud and answer. It's a lot to cover and it's pretty broad concepts. So. And April just put the link to the resource page. So you have access to that. And remember, if it has an asterisk, you will be provided that at the test. So. There's, there is a question where um, you need a doc, there's a PDF where you click it and that's how you're gonna answer the question. So if it's a super specific question like that, um, your resource will be there. Oh, so what is the date of the test? April 20. I know mine's a Thursday and it's like the last week of April. <laughs> the 29th. The 29th. Okay. My, the aquatics test is the 29th. Okay. And then the last one. <laughs> yeah. The very last one. Um, what was the catch and kill fish you talked about earlier? That is the Northern snakehead. That is an invasive species here. Uh, and that's, catch and kill. If you look up fishing regulations and you look up the species and what you what the law is, that's a catch and kill species right there. The northern snakehead is, um, it's that's one of those out competers. It's incredibly strong and muscular. They call it a snakehead because it has very snake-like pattern and a snake-like head. They have a bunch of really sharp teeth and they eat just about everything. And um, they can breed at any time, of the year, multiple times, any time, and protect their brood too. So it's, it's a tough one to kill. Um, and then what was the livable pH you mentioned? That's around eight. Um, but it can change depending on species, but just know, you know, eight is the, the good average. Um, it's usually a range. So for instance, I have some sunfish bluegills in an aquarium here um, at my house and their range is around like 
5 or something up to 8.5. That's their pH range that they can withstand. Um, but like I said, that goes up into the 8. So if you know 8, that's good. And there's like five minutes left if anybody wants to throw any last Since questions. Now's the time. And then Abby asked, is the test individual or with your group? Um, it's with your group, yeah. So April, maybe you can give them a little more in depth on that. Sure, yeah, um, it's with your group. Um, everyone will have access to the test um, through the virtual platform. Um, and then you'll work together um, whether you have, it, it really depends on what your school system is allowing and when you decide to work on the test. Um, the tests each day um, is a different subject for the first, for that Monday through Thursday. Um, and the test will become available at 9 a.m. and they will close at 9 p.m. Um, so you'll have those 12 hours. Um, any two hours within that you can work. Again, the test, we're giving you two hours, but it shouldn't be two hours straight unless you're really, really adamantly looking through it. Um, we hope it's not that hard for you at least. Um, <laughs> and uh, you will work as a team. So I know some groups may be able to meet in person and socially distant um, to work on the task uh, together. Some may want to work through Google Hangouts, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, um, or another virtual platform, and the team captain will submit that test. Yes, each test uh, day, so Monday is soils, Tuesday is um, forestry, Wednesday is wildlife, and Thursday is aquatics. Each subject is done uh, that day. So you have between nine and nine to do that subject that day. Um, you can choose to do it during the school day if your time allows, or you have um, after school hours up until submitting at 9 p.m. So if you're doing the very last, we recommend you don't start after 7 p.m. so that you have those whole two hours. Um, but you know it, it depends on what your team has available. And we'll be sending some more information about the actual like testing day and what it might look like as we get closer. And before we go, there was the question, uh, where did it go? Will we have to ID aquatic plants? You won't have to ID them, but one of the bullets was uh, being able to know, identify them descriptively. Um, so I would say, I'm trying to answer it without giving the answer. Um, <laughs> know those common native and invasive plants, like uh, the, the most common ones I gave you descriptively. So if you know that it's native or, or not, that will help you in identifying it. And then they'll give you a few other descriptors. So, um, and I, again, in the slides, if, if it's in the slides, I tried to like narrow it for you guys a little bit because I know there's a quadrillion species out there. Those really common ones, um, be able to know whether it's native or non-native um, and a few descriptions of it. So if I, you know, for instance, Phragmites, if I said a really tall, vegetative plant, you know, um, in the marsh, it's invasive, something like that. So if you can descriptively be able to know what the plant is like. Um, and uh, one more minute, any questions, or a couple more seconds, any questions? Not, I will give you back two minutes of your Friday. <laughs> uh, Thank you guys for coming today and um, participating in this training session. I think this one will go up on YouTube as well. And um, if there's, I guess if there's follow-up questions, you can always shoot me an email, chelsea.miller at maryland.gov. Um, and thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, you'll be receiving some more emails as we get closer to the testing date. Um, I'll be sending it to coaches and all participants. Um, if you have not already, um, please, please, please create that associate account uh, through the University of Maryland Elm system. That is the online testing platform we will be using. Um, your coach should have the information if you did not get it personally from me. Um, we need that done as soon as possible so we can start getting you into the testing platform. Um, but other than that, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight and to any of our trainings over the past two weeks. And thanks to all of our resource people um, who have spent hours putting this together for you. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.